Hey everyone, this is Matsi. Quick news, we are now 10 days away from the end of our Kickstarter, the Pinoy Monster Lover Anthology After Dark, a mature, queer, monster-loving anthology comic by Filipino artists. Please help us get to our goal as we are 56% funded, and we'd like to make sure that all of the artists are paid well, and that all of the backers get their rewards. Please support this queer and trans celebration of Filipino folklore and Filipino artists. Every little bit helps, and all the support is highly appreciated. You can find us on Kickstarter under the Pinoy Monster Lover Anthology After Dark. We are included in the Projects We Love tag under Kickstarter, as well as the Heartstrings and Hardbacks Romance tag on Kickstarter. Since I'm still currently unemployed, this is the biggest way to support me as a creator and artist, so please do consider going over there as long as you are over 18. Thank you again, and enjoy the episode. You're listening to Hainai by Motsi Dapu, Episode 43, Uian. And so I began to push, encouraged him to explore all avenues, take advantage of his own power. Explore his options and all that. He was unwilling at first. He wasn't quite as rigid as Mary Ann, but he still believed in the ideals Master Savard espoused, but did not in the end abide by. He took his title very seriously, careful not to act against those he saw as innocent, but much more amenable to punishing the guilty. When it came to the matter of foci, he tried very hard to track them down and take them away from innocent people before they activated. But, well, he wasn't always successful. We couldn't sense foci until they activated, unless we came upon them by sheer accident and recognised them amongst the hundreds we'd created so long ago. An elder memory, it was not so unfallible. He tried to save those he could in the Myers Martyr when he became aware of them, but their fear was often too powerful and would consume these people before he could get to them. When he attained near godhood at Hyde, he began to find more foci to collect and to seal away. His new power allowed him to stretch himself before many spells at once, save the innocent, punish the guilty. It allowed him to discover things about people that justified when an elder chose them as prey. He could not read minds, but he could observe very well their actions, see them and hear them when they believed they were safe from prying eyes and ears. A few elders were so impressed by this that they asked to learn his ways. I learned these spells, Minerva as well, for she hunted more often than most of us. Even in murder he was a moralist, but by no ambition of his own did he come by godhood, and it was thrilling to have the ear of a man who was like a god. However, even while he looked to me for advice, still he hesitated. Still he was uncertain, questioning his own judgment. Questioning me? Years and years of this infuriated me. So I took a different approach. I know. Finally home. Got a lot to talk about. I mean, first of all, I'm worried that somebody's been listening to us. Our recordings. We've been recording stuff lately, since digital's proven a bit finicky around Supernatural. So we've been making analog recordings. So we have a record of what's been going on, you know? But there's been, I don't know, 
Ashvin said it first, and I'm not sure if it was just paranoia, or if he realized something after his encounter with Bolton. I don't know how, but somebody might be listening to our recordings, tracking our movements, interfering with communication. I had it in the back of my head that we'd gain some attention, but if I had any doubts before, after what happened at the meeting, we're definitely on the radar now. So, I try to be careful. I don't know if they can listen to phone calls, though. There's no sign of that yet, but if calls can be disrupted... I figure that if someone was trying to mess with digital communication, like some of our audio calls, we'd notice pretty quickly. I hope, anyway. Either way, either way, I made sure to have everyone in the room to bless them with Lakhambakwa's protection before we parted. Each of them with an amulet of their own. Laura with Marianne's necklace, Donner with his Nan's cross, Ashvin, well... He didn't need my protection, but I gave it anyway, as an offering. His own gods protect him now, and Hanuman is at his breast. And Murphy. When we had time alone, I asked about his strange amulet. A, um, presto card. You know, the one you tap to ride on the streetcars and trains. He told me it was a gift from Donner back when he was worrying about money and sinking all the funds he could access into his last year's college. Donner gave him a loaded-up presto without expecting anything in return. A hundred dollars' worth. Gave him freedom. To move around the city. I could understand why it meant so much to him. Then I... got in touch with Vanessa to see how she was doing. I was using a glamour that bore her face when I went after Richard Henry, and now that he's indisposed, Vanessa's most at risk. And as much as I dislike that woman, I still owed her for helping us, so I wanted to offer my aid. She was pissed, but she told me she had no plan to go into hiding. She was entirely certain running would only make things worse, and the benefactor would take it as an admission of guilt and kill her. There wasn't a single person who got away from him unscathed, she said. I didn't tell her about Richard Henry, but I understood her fear. I even offered her protection of my own, but she rolled her eyes at me and said that that was an even bigger admission of guilt. A neon sign saying she helped their enemies. Her very convenient lie was that we'd found a way to use her as an easy target. Because she was fairly high profile, one of the most, if not the most, visible of elders. She is, after all, an Instagram model. She said we threatened her for all the info we had, including Richard Henry's whereabouts, of course. She asked me what I did to Richard Henry, and I told her I was keeping him somewhere. A hostage, to draw the benefactor out of hiding and into the spotlight, since he no longer had his right-hand man to facilitate meetings with his elder allies. Well, Vanessa said. Best keep your eyes on me, then. I'll surely be the first one he'll be calling on after everything that's happened. She seemed... really scared. So I asked my... new friend if he could keep an eye on her. Speaking of my new friend... The old man agreed to let me help him, if only because of what's to come. The long winter... The thing all the elders seem to fear, even him. He told me he's cottoned on to the benefactor's plan from Richard Henry, but there are gaps in Henry's knowledge after he proved untrustworthy. Still, he does know what the benefactor told him, that there's a way for all elders to have power unending. After what Richard Henry revealed, about his own plans, about getting Savard's old machines to work as intended, set the stop clockwork back into motion. The old man has been trying to hunt down the centerpiece. Meanwhile, he wants me to do what he's been doing, though not half as well, he said to me. Humble guy. 
Not what I expected after everything I read about him, though. To be fair, considering what may have preceded his fall, maybe he got a painful dose of reality that night. Clarity is suffering. For some. He wants me to keep saving people from foci, which I would have done anyway. The more people I save, the more I starve the elders who benefit from the deaths they cause. I asked him about Jay, the journalist who wrote the Book of Elders. Turns out, he had no idea what happened to him until Richard Henry told the story. Their communication was sporadic, and when Jay disappeared, he searched for traces of the benefactor's interference, or Richard Henry's, or any elder that might have taken umbrage with his ability to fight back. But all signs pointed to a man who left so fast he had no time to make contact. I asked if he was the one who left the spell of protection on Jay's loved ones, since CJ admitted hers weren't strong enough. It wasn't him either, and he had no idea who would. Jay wouldn't have had the time. I asked about Jay's pocket watch, and he... It took him a little while to answer. Said he made it for his son before. He met Jay, intending to face the interloper that stole it from where he had hidden it. But in Jay, he found a truly good man. The best man who could have taken on the power it possessed. Someone who made him feel like he had a purpose, again, in fixing his mistakes, in using his own power for good, even if he would never believe himself good again. Also, Jay reminded him of someone he knew in a past life, a young man he thought of like a son who died tragically young. I asked him if he knew why he died. Jack Robin, John Isaac Weeks, Marianne Weeks' brother, who grew up alongside his own son, or so Jay recounted in his notes. He didn't know. He seemed surprised that Marianne knew when I told him how I found out about it. He was killed by a focus, and that was why Marianne betrayed Savard and his ideals. Ideals worth betraying, the old man said, though he admitted himself that even if he had known how young John Isaac, Jack Robin, had died, it likely wouldn't have swayed him the way it did Marianne. His goals seemed too lofty, too important, then, to waste tears on one man, even a man so beloved by those around him, by Marianne, by his own son. They were the best of friends, after all. Even the benefactor, who took on the title Jack Robin gave him, loved the man. But did he know why Jack Robin died, like Marianne did? The old man didn't know, but if the benefactor was aware, and regardless unswayed, then there was another reason to fear what this man was. A mirror of Savard. Monster that he was. His words, not mine. Speaking of the pocket watch, I need to talk to him about it, about keeping it from me. I don't know why he did, but he must have had a good reason. But I guess... But I guess I'm scared of what'll happen if he didn't.
Hi, Nai. Um, uh, there's news. Donner's mentor, Dooley? He heard from an old friend. After a painfully long time. CJ wrote him, and he wrote back. And Dooley went to see him, in person. Donner wanted to accompany him, but he's still in recovery, so I gave Dooley protection too, just to put Donner at ease. He was gone for a little while, about a week or two, before we received the next letter. He finally got to see his old friend again. Well, I say friend. I can't imagine loving someone that much and not being able to see them. He's staying with them for now. Donner agreed it was safer that way. And by them, I mean him and his... wife. <laughs> now that was quite the story. I couldn't wrap my head around it at first, but the way Dooley told it in his letter, he was happy. Happier than he'd been in decades. They call me Grandpa Franny. You know, that silly nickname he had for me. I used to hate it, but I missed hearing it for so long, and now... Twelve of them. <laughs> Twelve grandchildren, can you believe it? I've always wanted a big family. Just like this. It doesn't feel real. Dooley means a lot to Donner, I know. I only got to talk to him a few times since he started staying with CJ, but the way he described Donner was so different from the man I met and got to know. But there was a lot that made sense, too. Puzzle pieces clicking into place when I saw the full picture of the man Donner had become. Dooley didn't give too much away, but he did say he met Donner when he responded to a supernatural incident, when he was only 14. He said that I was a godsend, after all the years Donner spent trying to hunt down leads. I knew I helped, but I didn't realize that that was how Donner thought of me, at least according to Dooley. But you know. It's nice to be needed. At the end of the letter, there was something from Dooley's old friend. It read, Young had a lover. It didn't make sense at first. I certainly didn't know what it meant, and neither did Donner or Murphy or Ashvin. But Laura, she said it was tickling something in her memory, and eventually she remembered she heard about it from a DJ in the Dark episode, an older one. She'd have to dig it up, but she thought it might be... a song? Or a rhyme? It was the only thing Dooley's old friend wanted to tell us. I wonder if it has to do with why the benefactor threatened him. Because given what R.H. told us, the benefactor isn't supposed to go after the innocent. And I doubt this man was guilty of something so heinous, or else he'd be dead. If the benefactor had him right where he wanted him that night. Right before he left Toronto. So there has to be another reason. But what? What could make the benefactor so afraid of an ordinary journalist? You're listening to Hainai by Motsi Dapul. Hey everyone, it's Motsi. Right now there are people protesting in Israel to protect the right of Israeli soldiers to mass-rape Palestinian prisoners in self-defense. Israeli soldiers have been proven to be child killers and mass rapists. 
and this is being downplayed heavily by Western media. Continue to support Palestinians and support the end of the Israeli apartheid state. Because every soldier and every single one of those who have supported them must be punished for their crimes against humanity. There is no redeeming this. Please continue to supply eSIMs to Gaza so that they can continue to communicate with each other and continuously support heavy political pressure to sanction and dismantle the apartheid state of Israel. Take care of yourselves. Kalayaan para sa Palestina. Ingat. Hey everyone, this is Reg Heli, co-creator and co-producer of Hainai. Hainai is a podcast produced by Motsi Dappel, Yoi Halago, Alisa Jimenez, and myself, and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution non-commercial share-alike 4.0 international license. This episode was co-produced by Jesse Goodsell and written and directed by Motsi Dappel, who also plays the role of Mary the Twin. The role of Richard Henry was played by Tom Pilcher, and this episode also features Alistair Stewart as Dooley. If you'd like to chat with other listeners when this episode goes live, we do a live premiere every other Sunday at 9pm Eastern Standard Time or Toronto Time on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash HainaiPod. To help support the production of Hainai, you can subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash HainaiPod. You'll get to be a part of our early access program where we release episodes three days early on Thursdays at 9pm Eastern Standard Time or Toronto Time. You can also get bonus video, audio, art, and many, many more. Speaking of Patreon, we'd love to give a shout out to the following patrons for all their amazing support. Victoria Goodwin, Sooks, Pablo Neurotic, Melissa, Megan, Malaya Light, Madeline Hicks, Jaden, Faye Fungai, Evie Smith, Emma Haleig, Diana Cos, Danny, Baca Terrier, Astra Kim, Anna, Amelia Brownstein, and of course, Jesse Goodsell. If you can't subscribe monthly, you also have the option to buy us a milk tea on coffee, coffee.com slash Hainaipod. That's ko-fi.com slash Hainaipod. Our ad-free Hainai album, which has our official music and full episodes from Act 1 and 2, is also available in both Patreon and the coffee store. Check out our website, Hainaipod.com, for more news and updates, and don't forget to follow us on our blog, Hainaipod.tumblr.com, as well as our socials, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Hainaipod. Hainai is available on Acast and wherever you listen to podcasts. We hope you enjoy our Act 3 episodes, and as always, thank you, we love you, and hanggang sa mulit.